So hi everybody, it's Deborah Carter here from Preparation Tech. As you know, Preparation Tech is a series of video interviews with people whose work intersect with technology. I am so excited today because I'm talking with Dr. Ron Eglash from the University of Michigan. And Ron is really special because he has actually invented a whole genre of computing called ethnocomputing. And this is really exciting to me because in our programs that New Tech Kids teaches, there are a lot of kids from underrepresented groups, uh, from uh, children of color, children from immigrant, immigrant backgrounds, children from low income. And, you know, we are constantly battling this perception that technology is a white and Asian industry. And Ron has done some really important work to show that that's not necessarily the case. So Ron, take it away. Tell us about yourself and what you do that relates to technology. I'm a professor in the School of Information at the University of Michigan. I have a second appointment in the School of Art and Design at the University of Michigan. So I'm sort of part computer scientist and part anthropologist. I travel around to indigenous cultures around the world, um, look at their traditional knowledge systems, and then we see if there's some way to um, represent that through computational media. Fantastic. Why do you do the work that you do? And uh, why, why is it important? What motivates you to keep going in this direction? So when I was in school, I was uh, majoring in systems engineering as, as a, a master's degree student. And I would raise my hand in class and I'd say, well, what about questions of injustice? What about culture? They'd say, well, this is a class in differential equations. There's no justice, there's no culture, right? So I decided that when I got my doctorate, I would look at the other side of the world. And so I went to a program that had uh, Angela Davis was one of the professors there, uh, Donna Haraway. And, and so I felt like my other hand was now tied behind my back. I'd raise my hand in class. I'd say, well, could we use a mathematical analysis? And they'd say, well, mathematics was the tool of white capitalist patriarchy. So it really, it really didn't um, liberate me until uh, I felt like I could put those two things together. And that happened to be in uh, studies in Africa. Okay. And can you tell us a bit about your research, uh, the research projects that you are, you've done related to ethnocomputing and something called heritage algorithms, which I am totally fascinated by, by the way. <laughs> yes, so, so, so uh, Africa was where that all came together for me. Um, I had been looking at aerial photos of African villages and I noticed they looked like what mathematicians would call fractals. So if they were roundhouses, there'd be a circle of roundhouses, a circle of circles, and that circle of circle was arranged in a circle. If they were rectangular houses, there would be rectangles of rectangles of rectangles. So similar shapes at many different scales. Um, and that exactly defines what these mathematicians call fractal geometry. Before I was doing my work, fractals had been used a lot to study nature. So you look at a tree and it's a branch of a branch of a branch. You look at a cloud, it's a puff of a puff of a puff. So nature uses these self-organizing systems to structure itself. But of course, in Europe, we were uh, developing uh, mathematics for looking at things from the top down. And so uh, we came up with the geometry of Euclid, right? Squares and circles of rectangles. It wasn't until very recently that fractal geometry uh, was created so that we could now model things that were happening in nature. So when I looked at these aerial photographs of African villages, you know, a, a light bulb came on over my head, right? I, I, I realized there's something really interesting going on here. Um, so I got a Fulbright uh, so I could spend a whole year just traveling around Africa and interviewing people and ask them about these shapes. Now I was at first just thinking of it as something that happens unconsciously, Kind of like the way a, a termite mound is a fractal or a coral reef is a fractal emerging from the bottom up. But when I started interviewing people, it turned out they knew exactly what the shape of their village was. And there was a, a spiritual system, a kind of cosmological vision of the nature as a kind of um, self-generating unfolding system. And it was not just in the architecture, it was in textiles and sculpture. And of course, once I started to realize it was in cornrow braiding, then I thought, wow, there is just a whole principle here at stake that needs to come to light. 
So I wrote this book, uh, African Fractals, and I figured at this point, my job is done. Now I, I can you know, hand this out to teachers and we'll have African mathematics in the classroom. So I started going to math teacher conferences and I would hand out the book and give lectures and people would come up to me afterwards and say, well, this is awesome, but I have no idea how to teach this. Fractal geometry is a college level mathematics classroom. I teach in high school. Yeah, I've got African-American kids. They're struggling with the math, but how is this gonna help them? They don't know anything about Africa. So I asked them out of all the examples in the book, what do you think would resonate the most with the kids? And everybody said the same thing. They said the cornrow braiding fractals. So that was our first simulation. And we set it up so that it isn't just a gee whiz thing. The kids can go onto this website, uh, csdt.org, for culturally situated design tools.org. Uh, the kids can go on this website and play with it, right? So you can use mathematics like a paintbrush to create these braiding patterns. And you're simultaneously learning the math, but you're also learning something about your heritage. When I started out in New York, I would ask the kids before our workshops, well, you guys know where cornrow braiding comes from, right? They'd say, yeah, it was invented in Brooklyn. So that's why I knew it wasn't just, it wasn't just teaching the math side of it. We also needed to teach the history, right, and the politics of this and, and the struggle to, to get black aesthetics to emerge as a sort of legitimate thing. Even today, you know, you, you constantly hear cosmetologists complaining that, well, in order to be able to run my braiding shop, I had to go to this expensive school and get this cosmetology license. Even today, that knowledge is suppressed. So once we had this, um, the, this uh, cornrows uh, software running well, and we could really show statistically significant improvement for the kids' uh, performance and interest uh, in these careers, then uh, we were able to go to the National Science Foundation and get funding to do this for multiple cultures, not limiting it to uh, African culture. And what were the other cultures, for example? Can you give us kind of a sampling? of these Yeah, cultures? yeah. Um, so a, a group on the Shoshone Bannock Reservation in, in Idaho uh, had seen the African Fractals book and contacted me and said, can you show us fractals in Native American culture? Wow. And I said, no, I can't. There's, <laughs> there's a chapter in the book that contrasts African fractals and show that lots of other cultures don't have those. And they said, well, come out here anyways. So I came out and everybody was doing this beautiful beadwork. And so I said, well, let's make a virtual bead loom like we made the virtual cornrows software. Um, and that's actually been one of, the, one of the most popular hits with math teachers because it fits the Cartesian coordinate system you know, in a very precise way. In fact, one of, the, one of the teachers told me that a kid stood up in her classroom halfway through the lesson and said, wait a minute, we shouldn't be calling this the Cartesian system. This should be the Native American coordinate system. So he, he really got it. Um, so so uh, my uh, wife also uh, teaches here. She's a professor in the School of Art and Design, Audrey Bennett. Um, and Audrey loves quilting. She's African American and she really loves in particular the G's bins quilting mater uh, uh, material. So uh, she had us create a quilting a simulation. Um, and then one of the things we've done with the quilting simulation after the kids have done their virtual design, um, then they can use a laser cutter, um, cut out the shapes that they've created and use um, iron on glue and come up with these beautiful physical quilt designs that they've done. Oh. So that's now really become um, an important part of, of the, the workshops is not only the kids doing the virtual part, but also the physical part. The making, the maker education, this kind the of making stuff. part of it, yeah, yeah. I just love this. I read also that you were looking at Latin percussion. I got to ask you. So, what's the connection with Latin percussion? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so if you look at something like uh, Afro-Cuban percussion or bomba plena on on uh, the island of Puerto Rico, um, you'll you'll hear one cycle that's maybe a, a four-beat cycle and then another cycle that's maybe a two beat cycle, right? And those will come together every two beats, right? Um, and then every four beats. So what you can think about is what's the least common multiple? So two cycles of the two beat will give you four beats, but that's just four beats versus two beats. 
So then if you look at something like three versus four, the, the least common multiple there is 12, right? So, so we've, we've got the, the, the kids um, uh, using this software, um, creating their little rhythm patterns, and then we challenge them, make these two cycles stop at the same time. So through experimentation, they, they essentially discover least common multiple, right? And then when the teachers go and we release common multiple in the math class, you know, we've had kids raise their hands and say, wait a minute, I know that I invented this. I know exactly what you're talking about. So it really makes it, you know, uh, uh, it takes something that was this obscure, why am I learning least common multiple? And you start to see the, the, the heritage algorithm, right? The, the mathematical algorithm. Right. Can you go back and explain a bit the heritage, heritage algorithm? So when I was doing research about you, it was a lot about ethno-mathematics, but now we're talking about ethno-computing. So can you maybe explain the computing side of all of this? Because we're focused really with this series on technology. Right. So, so um, say you're a, a white person in 1600 and you're trying to take over other people's land you're not gonna compliment them on how sophisticated they are and try to understand them. You're gonna tell them, you guys are primitive. You've just barely crawled out of the cave. And that's why you need me, the civilized European parent, to take over your country. And, and usually you need to add in some cannons and some rifles, right? You're not gonna win by rhetoric. Um, but if you repeat that often enough and, and you drag people in chains to the, the same church every day, uh, over time, that myth of uh, white supremacy starts to sink in. And so in order to undo that, it's not just a matter of decolonizing the lands, you have to decolonize mind, right? So when I, when I say the word uh, uh, ethnomedicine, people say, oh yeah, there's some kind of herbs that the you know, traditional doctor used. Um, even if I say ethnomathematics, they say, well, yeah, I guess I, I can learn how to count to 10 in Yoruba. Right, um, but ethnocomputing is a little bit dissonant. Why? Why would you be talking about ethnocomputing? These people didn't have computers. Well, well, that's true, but they had things like weaving. And if you want to make a triangle in weaving, you might say, "Well, let me go up one over one, up one over one." Right? You've got this little iterative loop. You've got an algorithm in your weaving. Now, I've worked on the Navajo reservation, the Navajo Nation, um, with traditional weavers and ask them about those algorithms. So you would think that if it's going up one over one, up one over one, that's a 45 degree angle, but it's not. And so if you get out your, your little protractor, um, you'll, you'll find it's about 32 degrees because the, the vertical thread and the horizontal thread are not the same width. So, so um, if you, Think about what the, you know, these Navajo uh, weavers have been doing. They've created their own set of algorithms, their own set of mathematical theorems and proofs. This is what I need to do to compose uh, the following triangles into the following sequence. But it doesn't necessarily map on to the same one that Euclid created, right? Now, if you look at the particular thread that they're using, the, the reason it's so thick is because they're raising their own sheep, they're carting their own wool, and they're dyeing it with local plants and, and minerals. And so when I, when I talk to scientists, I'll say, I know you guys understood me when I said up one over one is part of the algorithm. But from a Native American point of view, the sheep is part of the algorithm, the plants are part of the algorithm, right? And if you look at the, the computational complexity of biodiversity, that's where you really start to see what these colonists were blind to. Now, for your, for your uh, lunch yesterday, you uh, might have had something with tomato sauce on it, like spaghetti or pizza or tomato slices in a burger, right? You might have had some French fries, corn on the cob. Those are all Native American plants. They didn't exist in Europe. And if you look at the Native American plants that we now have in our diet, it's mind blowing peanuts, hot peppers, pineapple, tomato, cassava. I always thought cassava was an African plant. Yeah, it's too. not, it's a world plant. Avocado, vanilla, chocolate, strawberries, blueberries, 
Um, the early cure for, for uh, malaria symptoms, uh, chinchona bark that gave us uh, quinine, uh, that was a Native American invention. The invention of rubber from latex plants, that was a Native American invention. So it's not true that Europe was up here with all these sophisticated inventions and indigenous people who were way down here with nothing. What happened was a little sleight of hand where colonists came in, extracted all the value of thousands of years of Native American plant breeding, and then convinced everybody, oh, well, that was just nature, right? Science and technology are done differently in these indigenous traditions than they are in Europe. Europe is all about economies of extraction. And so it's science and technology is specifically created for the purpose of extracting value and carrying it off elsewhere to a corporation or a colonizing nation. In these indigenous cultures, their science technology was developed for the purpose of preventing extraction and emphasizing sharing and the circulation of value in this unalienated state, right? And so, so it, it takes quite a bit of decolonization to open up your eyes to what's really going on and the wealth of knowledge that's in these indigenous systems. Beautifully put, wow, so deep. It's just, and I wonder what that means for our current approach to technology, to computing, and how we can bring some of those values back because there's a lot about technology that's broken. Ron, take us back to your childhood. How did Ron Eglish become Ron Eglish? What were you like as a child? What were your hobbies? What were your pastimes? How did your family or your broader community influence you? So um, my father was here where I am now in, in Ann Arbor um, and working in uh, Detroit as a psychologist for returned citizens, for people who had been through the incarceration system. And he um, kept hearing this line over and over again, I wish I could make amends. I wish I could, I could repair the damage I did. It was eating away at, at, at people's souls. And so he, he published an article in 1957, the year before I was born, that said instead of a, a prison system, a justice system based on retribution, we should have one based on restitution. And so he called it restorative justice. So he published the first articles on restorative justice right around the time I was born. Um, and and uh, it went nowhere. Nobody <laughs> was citing the work or paying attention to it. And then years later, uh, they called him up and said, we want you to be keynote at the International Restorative Justice. He said, the international what? You know, <laughs> he had no idea that this thing had blown up, right? Um, but it impacted me. So, so he got a lot of those ideas around restorative justice from um, Quaker traditions, Native American traditions. Uh, he worked as a volunteer uh, at the Red Wind community because one of the um, prison psychologists was, was Native American and had started this, this little uh, Native community. So, so um, I you know, kind of grew up around this atmosphere of, of thinking about both Native traditions as being very worthwhile and also just trying to think creatively around what you can do with concepts of justice. Fantastic. So then when you were in school, what were your favorite subjects and how did you build your interest in these subjects or even activities? Were you on the debating club? I mean, did you like English? Did you like public speaking? What kinds of things did you like? I was a hardcore geek. So I lived on a steady diet of science fiction and, and, uh, was just really into you know computers and all that stuff, robots. Um, and I read when I was in high school a book called *The Human Use of Human Beings* by Norbert Weiner. And um, it's it struck me that you know it's the first time I've heard a scientist talk about social justice. And so he had invented this field called cybernetics. And so I thought I want to go study cybernetics. So that's why I majored in in, in college. Okay, and then from there? Well, as, as well, like I said, I was a little disappointed that my other professors didn't seem particularly interested in that, and so I did my uh, doctorate in the History of Consciousness program at Santa Cruz, uh, and there, um, there wasn't actually that much interest in engineering mathematics, but at least I got to sort of hone my skills thinking about social justice. Perfect. 
So now you're in education. I just love what you're doing because it really is so impactful. What kind of person thrives in the area of reinventing education and, and repackaging and rethinking education so that it is much more diverse and inclusive? What's the mindset of someone like yourself and what are the characteristics that one would need to actually go into this field? Um, so our research office just contacted me and asked me for a list of students um, that I hired this summer to work with me. Um, and I was surprised that I have uh, maybe a dozen students. I, I guess I was starting to lose track there. Um, but but the, the diversity of their backgrounds is quite interesting. So I have um, one student who's a women's studies major. Um, I've got some students that are computer science majors. Um, some that are coming from school information some more from engineering. Um, I have a couple that are video game fanatics. And, and so um, what I've been trying to do is develop a research team that's diverse enough so there's lots of different niches that folks can, can fit in. I, I guess I'm, I'm sort of taking the question you just asked me and unanswering it. Um, <laughs> but I, th I think that, you know, the moral of the story is uh, it's more the, the, the uh, ethical vision and, and uh, a creative uh, uh, agency that you bring to something than it is majoring in some particular field, I think. And how do you cultivate that, that, that ethical-minded um, focus and also the creativity? Because uh, a lot of parents come to us. Uh, I teach, uh, I own a company that basically teaches uh, primary school students about technological innovation and computer science concepts. And, you know, their parents are always coming to us and saying, what can I teach? What skills can I teach my kid? So how do you cultivate this, this real interest in ethics and in social justice from a young age in kids? Just some of your yeah, ideas. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so um, I, I think folks often pass by the opportunities that are right in front of them. So, so every high school uh, biology teacher I talk to knows Charles Darwin, the, the inventor of the theory of evolution. And I'll, I'll go to these conferences and I'll, I'll ask them, what was the name of the boat that Darwin sailed on? And everyone says, the Beagle, because that's a very famous, you know, that was the boat that Dar Charles Darwin's. Then I ask them, what was the stance that Charles Darwin had on the abolitionist movement? Dead silence, nobody knows. Darwin, Darwin was a hardcore abolitionist from generations of hardcore abolitionists. I so had when no he, idea. Yes, so when, when he went to school, um, it was with this idea that we are all of one family, the family of man. So he asked himself, how did we become so different looking in our skin color and nose shape? And he came to the conclusion, well, we must have started in Africa. And then for some reason, when you go to a different climate, your body adapts, right? In other words, his idea for the theory of evolution came from his abolitionist convictions. But if you read his first book, he carefully left human beings out of it. Because had he said that up front, everybody would have dismissed it and said, oh, well, this is just politics. You're just trying to make it look like we're all of one family, right? So, so there's, there's lots of these examples where when you look at um, uh, the history of science or even present day scientists, they keep their politics a little bit muted, but it doesn't take much effort to find out, you know, who are the folks who are really thinking this way. And, and I, would, I would say the same on the, on the flip side. So if you look, for example, at what's going on uh, in hip hop, with music, uh, with, with, with uh, uh, artists in uh, either DJing or rapping or, 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 or uh, music production, um, a lot of them are fanatics for technology. And there's even a, 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 some groups that have now done team ups with educators. Wow, fantastic. So I know that you are busy uh, developing teaching resources. You mentioned your site. Right. So tell us a bit about that, uh, just to, to give us, just, just give us the sales pitch for this wonderful resource, because <laughs> folks should know about this, right? Teachers right. should know about this. Is this also applicable for parents, caregivers as Ab well? Abs absolutely, absolutely. So we've, we've, we've tried to, to, you know, early on, I realized teachers don't need another struggle. They don't need another 
platform to learn or anything else. And so it really has to be something where you can just stick the kid in front of the screen and say, just go through these instructions, right? Um, so, so that's the way it works. Uh, when you go onto the site, csdt.org, you'll see lots of different cultural groups um, and some tools that focus on multicultural connection. So for example, the quilting tool um, includes not only African-American, which is G's bands, but also Native American, uh, Asian, Pacific Islander, um, even, even Appalachian. So we have white culture in there as well. Oh, tell us um, about that. I'm very curious. Uh, sure, yeah. So the, the first step is that the kids learn about the cultural background. And so if you're in a classroom, you would divide it up into groups and say, okay, you guys study this one, you guys study this one, and then report back on what you found, right? You wanna emphasize discovery learning where the kids are just you know, finding things for them on their own. Um, so the group doing the Appalachian uh, uh, cultural background, um, we've got the, what's called the radical rose pattern. And I didn't know about this when I started studying quilts, um, but it turns out there's all these quilts from the Appalachian region that were raffled off to raise money for the Union Army in the north. And this symbol, the radical rose, was a symbol of um, alliance with the abolitionist movement. Now, of course, if you look in those areas today, you know, it's nothing but Trump country, right? Um, and at some point, they were, they were duped into thinking that they needed to switch this alliance. But at the time, uh, poor white people recognized what they had in common with enslaved black people, right? And it, and, it's, and it stuck with them. So you can see the kids, you know, kind of opening their eyes to this, right? And, and, and uh, not just uh, white kids, but Native kids and African-American kids, um, that everybody's starting to realize there's a, a different side to history than, than what we're, we're typically told. So that's the, the cultural background. That's the first step. Um, the next step is a tutorial. And so um, once you click on that, it shows you a little video clip, here's what to do, kind of holds your hand and takes you through it so the teacher doesn't have to be an expert in this stuff. Um, and then the next part of it, you can either just jump right into the creative part. Let me just play around with this and make some cool designs. In which case you're reinforcing, you're practicing the math and computing concepts. Or you can go into a challenges section and some of the teachers we've worked with have said you know this creative play is just too open-ended I, I need my kids to focus on these particular topics and so that's what the challenge section is for your your challenge is to create this beadwork pattern but in order to do so you're going to have to use this math concept or this computing concept and and so the the final step then as i said is the physical rendering part we're kind of getting geared up for fall and COVID and the possibility that kids are gonna be learning from home. And so I've ha asked my students this summer um, to take what they've been doing with things like 3D printers and laser cutters and figure out how to do that with scissors and paper. Oh my gosh, So, I love so uh, it's almost like having a, a, a paper-based 3D printer. You know, you can see these paper sculptures emerging out of the work. So very exciting stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Two more questions and then I'm done. I'm, this is just so fascinating. Thank you so much for this interview. One is, if you could climb on your soap, soapbox and, and, and give a message to the tech industry the way it is now, which is largely white, largely Asian, largely male, what would your speech be about ethno-computing, heritage algorithms, and the role that, that underrepresented people should take back from tech, what would that be? So uh, often when I speak to folks and describe what we do, they say, oh, I get it. So you're tricking the kids into learning. It's like, it's like culture is the cheese and the kids are little rats and here's the STEM pipeline, right? And that's not at all what we're up to. So I, I think uh, the way in which our work thrives the most is when we can get funding, whether it's from the tech industry or the National Science Foundation or whomever, um, to, to make a connection to that local community. And so we've done things like um, gone out and found uh, 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 cornrow hair braiders, professional cosmetologists, who are willing to, to um, learn the software, come into the classroom with us, um, and work with the kids and get the kids to see that this stuff is relevant at the grassroots, right? 
Um, and then on the other side, we've worked with those adult entrepreneurs, whether they're textile artisans or hair braiders or urban gardeners or whomever, um, to now look at the kinds of technological innovation that could happen in the grassroots on the ground. I think one of the, the biggest problems we've had is that when we get federal funding for a project, we immediately ask, okay, how, how can this uh, assist these giant corporations in what they do? Yeah, the giant corporations are already billionaires. They don't need federal assistance, right? I wanna know how can I reinvent the laser cutter so it's relevant to grassroots textile organizations, the folks that are making these masks, you know, in the, in the, the city of Detroit, right? Um, I want to know how we can refashion artificial intelligence to better serve grassroots business opportunities, not these giant tech companies. They don't need the help. They've, they've already hired enough natural intelligence. So I, I, would, I would say thinking about innovation at the grassroots and reconnecting schools and communities. Awesome. Well, I always have this uh, ability to match on my previous interviewees with my current ones. So one interview that you should definitely check out is with Babusi Nyoni, who's a young Zimbabwean, self-taught, and he's an expert in machine learning and big data. And he took a huge data set of black women's hairstyles and created a whole app around this which is so super useful for black women. So you talk about like, you know, the algorithms in the hairstyles and stuff. That's kind of the connection. My last question, do you have any specific advice for parents, caregivers, teachers, or school guidance counselors on how to engage children from a young age with technology to, to, to foster their passion about it and their interest in it? I, I think the, the key is two things. Um, one is the guidance to the kinds of resources I've been talking about. Um, and the other, the other key is agency. So too often we're sort of stereotyping the kids saying, well, you're African-American, so you'll probably be interested in such and so. You know, and <laughs> that's, that's dead right there, right? It's much better to offer them all these opportunities. And, and for the kids who just wanna geek out with this, stuff, they are welcome to do so, right? And they'll make their own social justice connection. So both providing the opportunity and then that space for their creative agency. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you so much, Ron. This was an excellent interview. I am just so happy, like I said, to discover your work. And I'm just going to now work with my teachers to see how we can integrate it in even at a younger age. But I think it is the work you're doing is so vital. So thank you. And I look forward to taking uh, taking good use of your resources and following your work so thank you my my pleasure